From Ohio to Louisiana, North Dakota to Virginia, this is American Radio Journal. On this edition, what will the political future of the Republican Party look like after the end of the Trump presidency? The Hill columnist Keith Naughton is here to discuss. Going forward, conservatives need to determine what elements of the Trump presidency should be kept and built upon. Jessica Anderson of Heritage Action talks about the way forward. The Trump administration made fundamental changes to America's trade policies. What changes might be made by the Biden administration? Eric Bame of Reason Magazine gets details from Clark Packard of the R Street Institute. And there was a time when the nation could actually agree on what was true. On this week's American Radio Journal commentary, Dr. Paul Kangor from the Institute for Faith and Freedom at Grove City College says there's no such acceptance of facts today. I'm Loman Henry, and welcome to American Radio Journal. Donald Trump has dominated the political scene for five years. As he leaves the presidency, the Republican Party must adjust to the post-Trump era. Here to talk about what it might look like is Keith Naughton. Keith is with Silent Majority Strategies and is a columnist for The Hill. Keith, welcome back to American Radio Journal. Keith, we are back in an unfortunately familiar situation where we have impeachment against the president moving through Congress. We've had the very unfortunate riots of a couple of weeks ago. All of this leads to the question, where does the Republican Party go to from here? So first of all, your global thoughts on where the Republican Party stands amid all of this. Well, I think at this time, it's a bit of a low point but I think that's relatively uh, temporary. I mean, I think people get a little, go a little overboard on their political analysis. The impetus behind Trump and his supporters hasn't uh, changed. In fact, it's reflected in a lot of the electorate. There's still a lot of issue with income inequality and whether the advances and the and the growth in the economy and that success is being shared by everybody, which I think most people would agree it, it has not. And there's a lot of dislike of political correctness and elite control and big tech's control over so much of the economy and so much of the messaging in this country. That's not going away. It's just a matter of of Republicans and even Democrats on the left have attempted to do this of presenting some real alternatives and presenting good candidates that people can support. In terms of a legislative agenda, you touched on income inequality and, of course, Trump populism, largely fueled by that. It's an issue that the left has capitalized on more. What do Republicans need to do from a policy perspective, even though they are a minority now in Congress, to try to recapture the high ground on that issue? Well, I think you've got to look for ways to uh, spread income and spread wealth around without creating a welfare state. People don't want a welfare check. They want to work and they want to get fair pay for uh, their jobs, fair pay for what they do. So finding a way to do that is very important. Uh, We've gone through a period where Republicans have simply said, well, let's just cut taxes and let the chips fall where they may. Well, the chips have ended up falling in, falling into the laps of Wall Street and Silicon Valley. That's not spreading it around. So we've got to find a way to spread that wealth to more people, but not as a welfare check, but maybe as an earned income tax credit or something of that nature. But if you don't do that, you're going to be back right back where you were 10 years ago. Of course, as we move forward, even though he will no longer be president, Donald Trump is going to be a towering figure in the party. What do you see for his future here, Keith? Is he still a viable potential candidate for 2024? I don't think he's a viable potential winner. I think he is a viable potential candidate in that he's got a group of hardcore supporters And the nature of the Republican primary system on the presidential level is that you can get a minority of the vote, but as long as it's the largest minority, you can take all the delegates. You know, you can really rack up 
a big lead on the nomination contest, getting only 30, 32, 35 percent of the vote and be far out ahead, even though you don't have uh, a real mandate. And the issue with President Trump is I don't think he can win a general election. Even if he's lost five or six percent or that ceiling is dropped by five or for six percentage points, that's just uh, hopeless. So it's time to move on to someone who can win, because in politics, winning is everything. If you don't hold the levers of power, if you're on the outside, that's not heroic or principled. That's just being on the outside and let the opposition go, go up to their own mischief. Of course, there will in 2022 be U.S. Senate and the entire House of Representatives up for re-election or election again, Keith. Republicans face a challenging map in the Senate, but in the House, remarkably this past year, Republicans really narrowed the gap. One area where Republicans need to improve their performance are in suburban areas around the country. I'd be interested in your thoughts as to what the party needs to do to try to recapture those votes. I think people need to feel comfortable with Republican candidates and comfortable with the message. I think that the hardcore left on the Democratic Party, they can't help themselves. They're going to push their agenda, which is not supported by a majority of the country, which I do not think is supported in the suburbs. The Republicans have to present a reasonable alternative. So, The rhetoric has got to calm down. People are not interested in revolution. People are not interested in bringing what's happened in the uh, the protests in the cities out to the suburbs. So they want things to be nice and calm, but they're looking for an alternative to that progressive agenda, and that's what the Republicans need to provide. Let's talk for a minute about the Democrats. We have President-elect Biden about to take the oath of office. Democrats will be in control very narrowly of both houses of Congress. Keith, we're getting mixed messages. The president-elect's inaugural theme is unity. On the other hand, we have his party in Congress impeaching Donald Trump and engaging in a substantial amount of vitriolic rhetoric. Where does this leave the Democrats? They seem to be schizophrenic in their messaging. Joe Biden was the sort of anodyne alternative that everyone could get around, uh, rally around, or really rally against Trump. So he's not that big, charismatic leader like an Obama or like Trump was for the Republicans or Ronald Reagan. So I think the result is you've got all the Democrats freelancing. You know, they don't have that same loyalty. We have been talking with Keith Naughton, who is with Silent Majority Strategies. He is a columnist for The Hill. Keith, where can our listeners go to read your recent opinion column on where the GOP heads from here, as well as your other writings? You can go to thehill.com. I'm in the opinion section, along with a lot of other great writers. Keith Naughton of thehill.com and Silent Majority Strategies. Keith, thanks as always for being here. Thank you. Scott Parkinson from the Club for Growth has the week off. Filling in is Jessica Anderson. Jessica is the executive director of Heritage Action. She's here to talk about issues conservatives must focus on in the post-Trump era. Jessica, welcome to American Radio Journal. Jessica, last year, Heritage Action was very successful with a grassroots effort at reaching out to something like five and a half million voters. As we go into 2021 which is not a federal election year, but where we're going to have a lot of policy battles. What do you now do with those voters that you have already reached out to? Well, I think first and foremost, we have to recognize that voters all across the country are really looking for direction about where we go on a policy basis with our federal government. How does America they know and love and have learned to grow up with, how does that succeed How does it wane? What does it look like with federal and state policies that oftentimes try to limit opportunity or or limit economic freedom? And so when we were talking to voters this whole year, we were talking to these five and a half million voters across the country, largely swing voters. We were talking about what kind of direction do they want to see for America? And by and large, they reject socialism. They reject the heavy hand of government into their daily lives, and they want to see opportunity not only for themselves, but for their children, for their business. And so I think 
one, just making sure that we pay special attention as a conservative movement to these voters, not allow them to go back to the left or not to be overcome by the glossy messages of the unions or left-leaning organizations that are also active locally, that just has to be kind of in the back of our mind. And then practically speaking, what we're doing is we want to introduce all of these new voters that we met with. We want to introduce them to the grassroots leaders that are in their community, to Heritage Action Sentinels, and get them plugged in. Carry the conversation forward about what good policy issues we need to fight for, whether that's in opposition to a Democrat-controlled House and Senate or it's supporting measures at the local level, whatever that inflection point is, that they know that there are other people in their community that think about the issues the same way they do and want to see opportunity for all. So that's our focus right now. We're going, we're basically taking a second wave or redoubling our efforts to go back to these voters, remind them of the conversations in 2020, and try to get them further plugged in. And my hope is that after this, we'll be able to say that Of the 5 million we targeted in the election, a percentage of them stuck around and are now going to be voting for conservative policy issues and involved locally and running for school board and state house legislators and all of that. So I think there's a lot of work to do this year. I think there's a lot we can do to grow the movement through really specific and targeted ways like that. Is this an opportunity, Jessica, for the conservative movement to sort of refocus itself over the last four or five years with the Trump presidency. Obviously, Donald Trump's personality drove the whole policy agenda as well. As we move into this sort of post-Trump era, do you see the policy debate as settling more into talking about the particulars of the policy more so than personality as we go forward? Well, I think we have to spend a lot of time really understanding what policy elements of Trumpism are important to carry forward. So when I look at that from a conservative perspective, I'm most interested in what are the policies that advance opportunities for all Americans, both from a foreign policy standpoint, but then also our economic issues. I mean, one of the things that the Trump administration did so well was providing economic opportunity, was cutting regulation, was Giving, getting tax cuts where it's needed the most, removing the barriers to entry for new businesses. And before COVID-19, we had such a bustling and strong economy, and we need to look closely about what was working there. So I think when we look at kind of the landscape right now in the conservative movement, in the political movement, in the party, the GOP, all of that, we really need to pull everybody back to what are the constitutional freedoms that are presented in policies and how are those applied at both the domestic and international levels. And then from there, one of the things that Donald Trump did so well was he reminded elected officials that you need to fight for the forgotten man and woman, and you need to fight for all voters when it comes to policy decisions that are made in Washington. That spirit of working hard to represent opportunity for everyone across this country, we it would be a shame if that was left behind. That really is what I think needs to go forward. And that desire to represent all Americans and, and have policies that help and bring up and lift all boats, all of that really needs to be part of any conversation going forward, regardless of the political things that will be sorted out. I think we really need to look at those policies. And that's what brings together swing voters. It's what brings together these voters in, in the suburbs and keeps them sticking to our movement. So it's a long way of answering the question, but I I think we, we, we really need to look at the policies, what was, what's driving these voters, what's getting them excited, what they loved about Donald Trump and recognize that there is a place for that in the conservative movement going forward. And it shouldn't be shuttered. You referenced the suburban areas, Jessica, and that's an area where Republican candidates for Congress in particular have struggled in recent cycles. Given the fact that we have such an evenly divided Congress, 50-50 in the Senate, just a six or seven seat majority for Democrats in the House, these suburban areas, is there a particular role for grassroots advocates in those suburban areas where you have Democrats in swing seats to talk to them on a policy basis and try to pick off some support, if you will, from across the aisle for these policy agenda items that we have in the conservative movement. Yes, absolutely. And I actually think that the kind of 
fight for the soul of the movement is going to play out in these suburbs. If you look at a a state like Georgia, we were on the ground the day after, or literally three days after the general election in November. We started back out knocking on doors. We we, uh, ran both a, a phone banks, text message banks, and a door knocking program through the entire special election all the way up until the 6th. We talked to about 2 million voters across Georgia, but we were focused primarily on five, the five main caller counties that are around Atlanta. And in those counties, we, we, we laser focus on a few precincts. And of the five precincts that we knocked doors on and spent time doing community organizing with around policy issues that we're talking about, these five precincts all went for the Democrat candidate in the general and they flipped to the Republican candidate in the specials. We have been talking with Jessica Anderson, who is Executive Director of Heritage Action for America. Jessica, tell us a bit about Heritage Action. Also, where can folks go on the web to learn more? Heritage Action is the premier or preeminent grassroots organization across the country. We have about 2 million activists, 20,000 sentinels. These are our team leaders in states, and we are committed to advocating for policy solutions that make life better for all Americans. We're the sister group to the Heritage Foundation, and you can find us at www.heritageaction.com. Jessica Anderson of Heritage Action. Jessica, thank you for taking time to be with us. Thank you so much for having me. America's trade policies were changed dramatically by the Trump administration. Are further changes likely during the Biden presidency? To learn more, Eric Bame of Reason Magazine talks with Clark Packard of the R Street Institute. Fights over tariffs and trade policy defined much of the Trump administration, but now that President-elect Joe Biden is about to be sworn in, you could see Congress seize back some of the authority that it has granted to the executive branch to control when America deploys tariffs. Hi, folks. I'm Eric Bain with Reason Magazine. Thanks for joining us on this edition of American Radio Journal. My guest today is Clark Packard. He is a resident fellow and a trade policy counsel for the R Street Institute in Washington, D.C., He follows all the goings-ons with the trade wars out there uh, around the globe, and uh, he joins us now on the phone to talk about where this might go in the new uh, Biden administration. Clark, thanks for taking some time and joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So, Clark, let's start with this concept of trade promotion authority, not something that that maybe a lot of people are aware of, but it's a significant thing. It's going to be one of the first significant battles uh, over trade policy that the Biden administration has to face because uh, in July, trade promotion authority will expire. The most recent trade promotion authority granted by Congress to the president will expire, and uh, that could be a, a significant fight. Yeah, that's right. As you mentioned, in in 2015, Congress passed on a bipartisan basis trade promotion authority. And what that, and it's a six year authority that was passed in in 2015. But what it essentially says is that it sets congressional priorities for what ought to be in a a trade agreement negotiated by, by the executive branch. And if the agreement meets the criteria established by Congress, then the agreement it enjoys expedited consideration in both the House and Senate. It essentially facilitates the negotiation of more free trade agreements, and it, it essentially becomes impossible to negotiate a, a serious free trade agreement without trade promotion authority. And so the Biden administration will inherit a situation where the authority that was passed in 2015 under President Obama, the six-year authority will expire in July of this year. So there is a legitimate question whether or not the Biden administration will pursue trade promotion authority and to what end, right? If, if they get that authority, are they going to go out and push for more free trade agreements? It would be my hope that they would, but I don't think that that's clear quite yet. We'll have to wait and see there. Maybe the more interesting element to this debate is actually kind of the subtext of it, right, which is Congress could in July or sometime before then pass an extension of trade promotion authority or or a new trade promotion authority, uh, but they could attach conditions to that. And, And this is where Congress could get at some of those debates that went on during the Trump administration about who has the proper authority to impose tariffs, whether it's Congress or the executive branch. And, and we could see some of that resolved uh, in this, this TPA negotiation, right? That would be my hope. I think that for 80 years, right, the, the United States had established various authorities to impose individual tariffs if certain criteria were met. 
it established or it allowed the executive branch to do that. But I think over the last four or five years, or I guess the, the, the span of the Trump administration, it became very apparent that, that that process was broken because Donald Trump really sort of greatly expanded these authorities in, in making really dubious claims, right, that Canadian steel is a national security threat to the United States, which is obviously bogus. But that was the basis for the steel and aluminum tariffs, that it, there's a flood of imports uh, of steel and aluminum, including from uh, longstanding allies. And that poses a national security threat to the United States. So therefore, we're going to protect our domestic steel industry and aluminum industries with tariffs. But but that really angered certain key members of Congress, in, in particular members of the House and Senate Finance Committee and, and the Ways and Means Committee. And so there has been this debate in Congress about what, to what extent we should try to claw back some of the final authority to, to actually impose the tariffs maybe proposed by the executive branch. And so the, the debate over trade promotion authority presents an obvious opportunity to reassert some congressional authority over trade and say to the, the Biden administration, hey, if you want this authority to negotiate some, some new trade agreements, we're happy to give it to you. But here are the conditions. And one of those conditions, I think, should be that, that Congress reasserts itself a little bit in, in the process of imposing tariffs. We're talking with Clark Packard from the R Street Institute about uh, trade policy and where that might go for the Biden administration. Um, Clark, just a, a minute or so left here, and I, I want to get you out on this because I know there's probably a lot of people listening who think that, that President Donald Trump did the right thing in a lot of ways by imposing these tariffs, even if they weren't successful. He at least kind of raised this issue, maybe not with Canadian steel necessarily, that was an obvious misstep, but with uh, China, for example, raising the profile of the, the economic issues there. Tariffs are, are not the right way to go about that. But if the Biden administration is going to pick up the ball and keep running on, you know, on the, the China front in particular, what sort of trade policies would you look for? That's a, a big question, I guess, and I'm not giving you a lot of time to answer it here. But where should Biden go in that direction? President Trump at least gets some credit for correctly identifying a lot of these problematic issues that that China and Beijing engage in. But ultimately, his, his tariffs, as you mentioned, were fairly self-defeating. But again, he, he correctly identified the problems. Now, where I think President Biden is correct, or I think is, is utilizing allies to put pressure on China to change its policies, rather than unilaterally taxing ourselves, I just never thought that that would change Beijing's behavior. But I think with added market power of U.S. allies, we may be able to, to force some changes on the margin to Beijing's trade policy practices. So look for Congress to potentially take back some of its authority over tariffs and trade and uh, look for President Joe Biden to bring some allies into the fight against China. Both of those things, I think, would be would be welcome, at least from from my perspective. And it it sounds like from yours, too, Clark. Uh, Unfortunately, we are out of time for today. Uh, Again, that is Clark Packard from the R Street Institute. Uh, Thanks for taking some time with us, Clark. Yep. Thanks for having me on. And you can check out Clark's work at rstreet.org. He is a resident fellow over there and trade policy counsel. Again, check out his work at rstreet.org. For Reason Magazine, I'm Eric Bame. Catch all of our coverage of the transition into the Biden administration at reason.com. And you can catch me right back here next week on another edition of American Radio Journal. In a now bygone era, certain basic truths were generally agreed upon. Now the nation lacks voices that can speak with such clarity, and the result is a loss of confidence in our institutions. So says Dr. Paul Kengor from the Institute for Faith and Freedom on this American Radio Journal commentary. Where has the truth gone? So asked my Grove City College colleague, Dr. Jim Thrasher. Truth and reality, say Thrasher, have they gone away? Most journalists in the media seem to ignore the facts and create and advance myths and fables. They have become propaganda machines. And yet, notes Thrasher, God-given truth has not gone away. No, it has not. We're hardwired for truth. We're made for truth, to desire truth, to seek truth. But indeed, where has the truth gone? That's a question that seems to be nagging at many of us lately. It pervades our politics and media particularly relating to the current political presidential climate and the results of the 2020 presidential race. I've carefully followed the controversies regarding the presidential election, as many of you have, and those are going to continue beyond the inaugural ceremony this January 2021. 
Those controversies included claims by the Trump campaign and others of vote manipulation. I wrote a widely read piece a few weeks ago about an extraordinary claim made on November 25th in Gettysburg at hearings convened by the Pennsylvania Senate Majority Policy Committee. Presenting that day was retired Colonel Phil Waldron, a former combat officer in electronic warfare who testified along with Rudy Giuliani's team. Waldron, who specializes in analysis of election data fraud, talked about spike anomalies in voting patterns in the state of Pennsylvania. Waldron showed a chart that alleged a massive dump of votes for Joe Biden. A dump, said Waldron, that was, quote, not feasible or mechanically possible under normal circumstances, unquote. Waldron made a jaw-dropping claim in Gettysburg. He asserted that over about 90 minutes on November 3rd, a massive batch of votes registered roughly, here we go, 570,000 ballots for Biden and only 3,200 for Trump. Yes, 570,000 for Biden versus 3,200 for Trump. That's 99.4% for Biden versus 0.6% for Trump. When Waldron said this in Gettysburg, the audience gasped in shock. I watched the exchange, and if what Waldron said is true, it would constitute one of the most insidious examples of vote manipulation in the history of American presidential politics. That is, if it's true. I watched Waldron drop that electoral bombshell. What was equally shocking to me was how the press completely ignored it. The only national sources I could find reporting it were Real Clear Politics, Breitbart, and Newsmax TV. The video link that I watched was provided by a conservative source, Right Side Broadcasting Network. CNN never touched it. MSNBC never touched it. The New York Times didn't write about it. I promptly wrote about it. And I asked most sincerely, is this accurate? Who or what could have flipped votes like this? Is this real? My article posted at the American Spectator received an enormous number of clicks. It was posted by Real Clear Politics, where it was the most widely read piece for seven days in a row. And yet the response to that article, it broke down very simply. If you voted for Donald Trump, then you believed Waldron. If you didn't vote for Trump, then you called Waldron a liar. In fact, you called me a liar, too. One emailer wrote to me, you're a lying Trumpist propagandist and a hack. A friend of mine, a Republican never Trumper, told me to go back to writing about socialism. But no, I can't. I can't ignore claims like this, and neither should you. Whether you love or loathe Donald Trump, you ought to be able to look at claims like this with an open mind and desire for truth and justice. Biden, 570,000 votes versus 3,200 to Trump? 99.4% to 0.6%? Is it true? I just don't even know what the truth is anymore, one talk show host said to me. Who do you believe? Where do you go for accurate reporting? Indeed. So much of today's media have become propaganda machines. All are biased, all have agendas. It's harder and harder where to know to get the truth anymore. And if claims like that by Waldron are not answered and resolved, many Americans are going to feel cheated. For American Radio Journal, I'm Paul Kengor. American Radio Journal is heard on public affairs-minded radio stations all across the country, including KREV-FM in San Francisco, California, WIYQ AM and FM in Saxonburg, Pennsylvania, along with WCHN AM in Houston, Texas. American Radio Journal is produced weekly by the Lincoln Institute of Public Opinion Research, Incorporated. The Lincoln Institute is completely funded through the generosity of individuals, corporations, and philanthropic foundations, which underwrite the costs of this program. Comments and opinions expressed on this program are those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Lincoln Institute or of this radio station. Learn more about American Radio Journal and hear expanded versions of some interviews aired on this program, please visit our website, AmericanRadioJournal.com. I'm Loman Henry. Thank you for listening to American Radio Journal. American Radio Journal, lighting the brush fires of freedom.